Hi, Terry Shanefeld here for UAB School of Medicine. In this video, I'm going to show you how to critically appraise a diagnostic test study, and we'll talk about the three elements that diagnostic test studies must meet to assure the accuracy of the sensitivity and specificity estimate of that diagnostic test. It's important to critically appraise diagnostic test studies, or any type of study, because many studies are flawed. And Lidgmer and colleagues showed in JAMA in 1999 that diagnostic test studies with methodological flaws overestimated the accuracy of diagnostic tests. So you really may need to make sure when you're reading a diagnostic test study that's designed well so that the answer that you see can be more believable. So how are diagnostic test studies set up? Well, first off, we get a sample of patients um, who have symptoms of a disease that we're interested in. We apply our new tests that we're studying to them. We apply a reference or gold standard to them, and then we compare the results of the new test with the reference standard in a blinded fashion. So the critical appraisal process involves three steps. One, we need to figure out are the results of the study valid? That'll be the focus of this video. Two, what are the results? And then three, will these results help me care for my patients? Steps two and three are going to be covered in the apply section of this module. So there are three questions we need to ask ourselves when we read a diagnostic test study to determine that the results are valid is one, did the patient sample include an appropriate spectrum of patients to whom the diagnostic test will be applied in clinical practice? Number two, was there an independent and blind comparison to a reference standard? And then number three, did the results of the test being evaluated influence the decision to perform the reference standard? So when I read a paper, I'm trying to answer these three questions to determine the methodologic validity of that diagnostic test study. So number one, appropriate spectrum of patients. What this means is our new test should be performed on a group of patients for whom it will be applied in clinical practice. So three principles here. We need to be uncertain that the patient has the diagnosis, because if we knew, there'd be no reason of applying the test. Two, our patients should have a wide spectrum of severity of disease. They have both early and late disease. And importantly, they should have diseases um, with which the symptoms can be confused. Um, so for example, pulmonary embolism patients often present with shortness of breath. Well, there are lots of different things that can cause shortness of breath like pneumonia, congestive heart failure. So we'd like to see patients with other diseases um, which can be confused with the disease that we're interested in included in the study because we want to make sure that our new tests can differentiate um, our patients with the disease that we're interested in from other patients. So broad spectrum of patients. Now what we're going to do in this video is I'm going to have several excerpts from the PyoPed study and what I'd like you to do is I'll tell you to pause the video and I'd like you to read the, the portion of the paper I show you and see if you think it meets the criterion. So in this particular case what I want you to look at is this section of the paper over here and figure out do you think this is a reasonable spectrum of patients. And for many of these criteria, both in diagnostic test studies and other studies that we'll read, you use your clinical judgment in making this assessment. You don't have to have any statistical knowledge to know if the spectrum of patients enrolled in this is appropriate. You want to see is were there people who the disease could be confused with, broad spectrum of patients, etc. So just as a background, the PyoPed was the study that looked at ventilation perfusion lung scanning or VQ scans for the diagnosis of acute pulmonary embolism. Prior to this, the best study that we had was a pulmonary angiogram, which was dangerous. Uh, you'd have to insert a catheter into a patient's lung, squirt dye. Some people died of this. Some had allergic reactions. Some had renal failure because of that dye. So we needed a new, new study, and this was the landmark study that um, looked to see if VQ scans were useful. So again, let's read this area here. Um, pause the video and do that. See if you think it was an appropriate spectrum. When you're done, restart the video and you'll see how I answered it. So let's see how you did. So the eligible study population were adults. Um, they were both inpatient and outpatient and who had symptoms suggestive of a pulmonary embolism and who had no contraindications to undergoing testing. So you have to decide, is this who we would use this in? I think so. Um, they talk about patients who have symptoms suggestive of pulmonary embolism. Uh, was it a fairly broad spectrum? Well, it was adults um, of all ages, and it was both inpatients and outpatients. So to me, it meets the criteria of being an appropriate spectrum of who I'd use this in, who potentially didn't have pulmonary embolism, um, groups who had other problems that it could be confused with. So I think it meets these criteria. Question number two that we have to assess diagnostic st test studies against is was there an independent and blind comparison to a reference standard? So two components here. The first is this issue of independence. And what that means is that the results of either test shouldn't be used as positivity criterion for the other test. 
So what does that mean? So let's use an example of um, prostate cancer. There are two main tests that we can do for prostate cancer. One would be a digital rectal examination where I palpate the prostate. Number two, I could do a PSA blood test. Well, I would not want the PSA blood test, if that's my new test I'm looking at, uh, to be considered positive if the patient also had a positive digital rectal examination. I need them to be independent of each other and not included with the results of each other to be positive. If we shift this to the what we're considering here is pulmonary embolism, I don't want the results um, of pulmonary embolism to include my new test, so I don't want to say a pulmonary embolism present if the reference standard test, which is angiography in this case, is positive, or if the patient had a VQ scan being positive. We can't have that, so that would be an example of incorporation bias. The other component of this is that the people reading these tests need to be blinded. We don't want the people reading the angiogram to know what the result of a VQ scan is and vice versa. If that happens, then that's called diagnostic review or test review bias. Now, I don't really care if you know these names. I'd rather you know the concepts. And the reason this is important, and we see this all the time clinically, is let's say I look at a CT scan of somebody's chest and I see a pulmonary nodule. When I go look at the chest x-ray, it's going to be much easier for me to detect that nodule because I know where to look and I know that it's there. So we don't want people knowing the results of tests when they interpret other tests because that will shape their interpretation of the test. So what is a reference standard, which we used to call gold standard? Well, we have to know who has disease or not in our diagnostic test studies. We need to be able to figure out if our new test correctly labeled people as diseased or not. So I have to have some way of knowing that people have disease, and that's what the reference standard does. Now, often a reference standard is a more invasive or expensive test, and that's why we were developing this new test. So a biopsy could be a reference standard. In this case, the angiogram is the reference standard. An autopsy is a great reference standard, but unfortunately few living people volunteer to undergo an autopsy. Sometimes the reference standard is only clinical follow-up alone. Um, and the reason that is is if somebody develops some bad disease, they should develop symptoms of it, ultimately get diagnosed down the road, um, be placed on treatment. Sometimes there is no reference standard. So angina is a clinical syndrome of chest pain. I don't have a diagnostic test to prove, to prove chest pain is angina or not. I do have a diagnostic test to say whether you have coronary artery disease or not, but not all angina is caused by coronary artery disease. So sometimes we have no reference standard. Often the reference standard is imperfect. And as we test new tests, we figure out, hey, the new test is actually better than what we thought was a good test in the past. And unfortunately, in these early studies, our new test is assumed to be inaccurate because we assumed our previous reference standard was correct. So we, sometimes it just takes us a little time to figure this out and when studies are done um, over a, a couple of years then we figure out that our new test is actually better than our old one and it becomes the new reference standard. So let's see how the PyoPed study did. Um, this table over here is the positivity criterion for a VQ scan and just kind of briefly look through it and you'll see you need to see if there's any mention of pulmonary angiography findings and then over here what I'd like you to do is look at this to see if the readers were blinded um, in when they read either the VQ scan or the pulmonary angiogram. So pause the video, assess these two things, restart the video and let's see how you did. So how did you do compared to me? Well when you look at these um, VQ results positivity criterion, um, there's no mention of pulmonary angiography, so they know they were independent. Over here, you can see that the nuclear medicine readers, which or the people who read the VQ scans, were done. It was done at a center that did not perform uh, the scan, and they were done independently of each other, so they did know the results. Same thing for the pulmonary angiograms read at a different center who didn't know the results. So to me, this means that these were all blinded, and I can feel comfortable now moving on to the third question, which is, did the results of the test being evaluated influence the decision to perform the reference standard? What this means, the short of it, is that everybody needs to get both tests, the new test and the reference standard. Um, in real clinical practice, though, um, we don't always do this. So in real clinical practice, if I have a negative test in something and I'm pretty sure I have ruled out that disease, I'm not going to do another study.
But that's not the case in a diagnostic test study. We need to know who really does and doesn't have disease with our reference standards. So everybody needs to undergo both tests. And if they don't, this is called verification or workup bias. And what happens with verification or workup bias is it overestimates sensitivity. It makes the test look more sensitive than it is. And a great example of this in the literature was the original study for PSA testing for prostate cancer published in the New England Journal. People who had a PSA test less than four, which was considered normal, um, never got a biopsy. So we never did prove if that level of zero to four really was negative or not because they never got any further testing. So let's read this excerpt from the PIOPED study. And I first want you to look over here to see what was determined for positivity criteria and then read over in this section to see um, if everybody underwent both the VQ scan and the pulmonary angiogram. Pause the recording, do your assessment, and then restart it when you're done. So let's see how you did. So one of the things we can see is that the PRIOPED protocol, the study protocol, required everybody to undergo angiography only if their VQ scans were abnormal. That seems to be a problem. We want people even with normal VQ scans to undergo angiography because we need to determine how good the VQ scanner is. Can it detect everybody? Does it miss people? So all of a sudden we might have a problem here. Well over here they tell us that pulmonary positivity criteria, pulmonary embolism positivity criteria were angiograms, follow-up, and outcome classifications. And here they tell us about what meant somebody did not have a pulmonary embolus. Now I'm highlighting an area here, underlining this area, because um, it import, points out one important thing that these researchers did. So while not everybody who had a VQ scan, especially those who had normal VQ scans, underwent pulmonary angiography, but what they all did do is undergo clinical follow-up. And this is like I mentioned on that slide earlier, that sometimes the reference standard is clinical follow-up. And the reasoning here was that if you had a pulmonary embolism, it should have come to somebody's attention at some point. You should have continued to have symptoms and underwent further testing, or you would have got put on anticoagulation therapy to treat that pulmonary embolism. So I think this is the best these researchers could have done. It would have been felt to be unethical if you had a normal VQ scan to undergo a potentially lethal or very dangerous pulmonary angiography. And while I admit I wish everybody would have undergone pulmonary angiography, I think it's the best that they could have done, so I give the researchers credit for this. So my final assessment of the PIOPED study is I feel it's very low risk for bias. I think there was a good spectrum of patients. Um, I think the people who, who read the studies were blinded to the results of the VQ scan of the pulmonary angiograms and vice versa. I think they were done independent of each other. And again, while I wish everybody would have had a pulmonary angiogram, I think the researchers did the best they could do. And really no significant pulmonary embolism would have been missed on clinical follow-up. People would have either died and had an autopsy and found it, or further testing would have been done down the road and it would have been found. So I think this study is reasonable enough for me to now go on and look at the results section and try to use this in helping care for my patients. I hope this video has helped you understand more about how to critically appraise a diagnostic test study. Remember, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact me through the course website or through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.